would like to introduce um, the next speaker um, who will be talking to us about CRISPR. All right, good morning, everyone. It's my uh, great pleasure to be here. Um, I do think the last conversation needs to be continued, and I don't know if I'm going to start that now, um, but there's very strong emotions that have to be addressed. And I don't know Dr. Ayala myself, but I used to be French, right? Um, I'm not French anymore. I got the upgrade to the blue passport. This could be its own conversation. Uh, but back in France, we used to kiss people, men and women, right? I've lived here 20 years. Um, I used to last, like to kiss people, obviously, not always French kissing, per se. Uh, but I'm American now, and I'm, and I'm a scientist. I'm a member of an academic society. I'm a faculty member. I'm a mentor. I'm a professional. And I would never kiss a woman, right, just because I have the license to do so. Because I do think it's disrespectful, it's inappropriate, and in a world in 2018 where we have to live in a culture that promotes and advances and respects women, I think my origin of country, my cultural preferences are superseded by the times that we live in. And I think it's very important to understand the perspective of the victims because the victims are the ones whose Emotions matter the most. So I, I hope we get to discuss that over the rest of the day. Um, so being French, former French, um, and working on CRISPR, I'm going to give a little bit of a contrarian perspective today. Because the world that I live in, the CRISPR world, actually is dominated by women. Is embracing women as scientists, as inventors, as entrepreneurs, um, for startup companies, for papers, for manuscripts and most important, perhaps, for awards. We're actually, the world of CRISPR is dominated by women, is led by women, is fueled by women, uh, is promoted by women, though I'm a guy talking about it today. It's my great privilege to talk about the CRISPR craze. Um, actually, a word, an expression that came from uh, Elizabeth Panisi back in 2013, a journalist at that. Um, and it's not crazy, right? It is, I think, a sign of what the future of science holds. And what I'm going to do today, and I'm going to try to be timely and respectful of time, and we're way behind, predictably, is I'm going to illustrate how women, several women, but some in particular, have shaped the CRISPR field already, have defined the CRISPR field. Uh, and I hope that some of the cards, the inventor cards, uh, which not enough have been picked up as of yet, will soon enough feature CRISPR women. At least one CRISPR woman, famous, uh, International Academy of Sciences, I think, and Medicine, and the Academy of Inventors, uh, the great Jennifer Dudna good friend of mine. So they have shaped the, the field. They are shaping the field. And I'm going to give you examples, tangible, actual examples of young women, young scientists, junior scientists, some fresh out of school, shaping the future of CRISPR already in the workplace. So we live in a CRISPR world, right? Who, everybody's heard about CRISPR, right? On the show of hands, who's heard about CRISPR, right? If I had asked that question five years ago, nobody heard about CRISPR. So in a very short amount of time, this technology and its heroes and its many applications have altered many a field. Arguably, CRISPR in many ways is perhaps the hottest field in biology. There's a lot of metrics that show that. Uh, whether you look at patents, whether you look at publications, whether you look at adgene deposits, I know Joanne is not here today, but this is a, a paper I co-published uh, uh, with a woman first author in the, the great CRISPR journal. We'll talk about that later on. Uh, CRISPR has taken over the world. This is a fact, um, and it's a fact that we can thank women for. And what's interesting about CRISPR is that in merely five years, we've gone from CRISPR, the scientific phenomenon, into CRISPR-Cas9 technology, aka genome editing technology, which is now being applied across the board in food and ag and medicine and biotech. And, and we are at a stage already merely five years in, where CRISPR products are upon us, whether they are therapies pending for clinical trials, or whether they are foods that are already on your plate that have been manufactured using CRISPR-enhanced, sometimes in natural ways, uh, products. I'm not, this is not a seminar on CRISPR, so I won't talk about that. Uh, but interestingly enough, uh, we are already four of the five steps into it, and the challenge laying ahead for CRISPR is acceptance. It's not technological. There's some technological enhancements that we need to do. But the technology itself and the science has advanced so fast and so far that the challenges ahead are how are we going to regulate CRISPR? 
right? We can talk about the patents and legal battles and, and very interesting narratives and stories, and many have been written and well covered. Uh, but how do we regulate this technology, and how is society going to accept that? I think that's the challenges that lie ahead. And, and in many ways, uh, the many women that are leading the field are best positioned to engage in those dialogues to get this solved. And it's also an example of how uh, science extends way beyond the academic realm. And team science has to supersede and exceed and transcend the boundaries of academia into industry and government and society to enable tremendous technologies like CRISPR to make it all the way to the public. So unbeknownst to most of you, uh, there's actually a relatively long history of CRISPR. CRISPR wasn't invented or discovered back in 2012, right? The, the history of CRISPR dates back over 30 years, 1987 already was the first paper on CRISPR. So CRISPR was born then and baptized 15 years later and characterized over, over 10 years ago as a biological phenomenon. But the reason you've all heard about CRISPR is not because it's an adaptive immune system in bacteria, it's because it's a very cool and powerful and useful and impactful genome editing technology. So how did, how did that happen? That was the work of two of the CRISPR heroes, two women. Emmanuel Charpentier right here, a French scientist who's, who's been around the globe. Many countries had some, some interesting growing pains in developing her career as a, as a junior scientist herself. And then the, the famous uh, and great role model, Jennifer Doudna. And what those two ladies led, and they led a team of scientists that had both men and women, co-first cool authors were women, right? The tr discovery of Tracer was done by a woman scientist in Emmanuel's lab. Um, they're co-inventors, by the way, on those technologies, right? And they are sometimes uh, vested investors and or uh, incentivized shareholders in some of those great companies I'll give you examples about. Um, and what they did, together with their colleagues, was take CRISPR, cas the immune system in bacteria, and repackage this as CRISPR tech, CRISPR technology. This is an inventive step. This is a non-obvious alteration and engineering of a natural system into a tool, and that enables people to programmably, predictably, accurately, efficiently, and easily uh, generate double-stranded DNA breaks. You cut DNA, and then the great Feng Zhang, I know we're here to talk about women, but minorities are important too, uh, was the first uh, to show that you could actually use CRISPR to not just generate double-stranded DNA breaks in the DNA of human cells, but in combination with DNA repair pathways, edit the genome precisely at the side of cleavage. So I'm not going to give a uh, an overview of CRISPR, but this is CRISPR, the technology, and this is CRISPR, the application for genome editing. We heard yesterday about Wikipedia, and Wikipedia not featuring women enough, so I had a great slide on the many awards that Emmanuel and Jennifer have won, and I went back to Wikipedia because I knew my list wasn't exhaustive, and, and this is just a portion thereof. Right? I, can't even, I don't even have enough time to go through what every single award means. I haven't quite done the research as of yet, but I'm gonna do it soon enough. I'm gonna make the statement on the record that this may be perhaps the most impressive list of awards that maybe any given scientist has ever had, let alone women, right? So, you know, we can ask the Karolinska Institute when the Nobel Prize may be given to CRISPR. And before we ask whom is gonna get it, I think the question is which prize are they gonna select? Uh, but the bottom line is that already the list of accolades and recognition and credit that has been bestowed upon the two most influential women in the field speaks for itself. Speaks for itself. You can measure it by the profile of the award itself, the uh, uh, standing of the nomination and or the educating committee and or the selection committees that have chosen those women and or you can measure it by a total amount of money received. And I'm sure there's other metrics we could use. But I think that regardless of the metric that you use, this list may be the most impressive list in the history of science. And what's interesting is that this is just the beginning. If you look at momentum, right, this really started a couple years ago, 14, you can see the list for 15, you can see the list for 16, it's almost like one or two a month. You can see the list for 17, and this is, again, not up to date. This, I think, illustrates 
the great potential that women have already achieved in science, but arguably the hottest topic in ag, food, medicine, and biotech today. Now, outside of this recognition, the potential of this technology is illustrated by the thousands of labs that have used this technology across different fields of science and shown the value of CRISPR tech, shown the potential of genome editing. And whether you're in industrial biotechnology, pure research, academics, therapeutics, ag, whether you like model organisms or food and ag organisms, or medical organisms, obviously the Wistar Institute is in play here, and then whether you like different flavors of genome editing is irrelevant, your world is expected already by CRISPR, thanks to Jennifer and Emmanuel. And today already, we have thousands of laboratories using those technologies and those applications to do a number of life-changing new product development, new knowledge development, new technology development across many fields. Whether you're in research, this is what ad gene would be. Whether you're in manufacturing, using bacteria, yeast, or algae, for food, enzymes, household care, bioenergy, and others, biofuels. We're already seeing a lot of products that are tangible and some accessible on the market. Give an idea, the CRISPR-enhanced starter cultures have been commercialized by DuPont globally since 2011. So if you've had one cup of yogurt, one bite of cheese, one slice of pizza, one nacho, one cheeseburger, anywhere in the world since 2011, you've already consumed a product that was generating using a CRISPR-enhanced starter culture. Do your research and check it out. But CRISPR is not new. That was like two, two years before CRISPR started, 2 BC, right? People were already using CRISPR to make better food. And now we know the white bud mushroom from Penn State, uh, waxy corn from Corteva, Pioneer, Dow DuPont, Dow Pont is in play. And hundreds of products are being developed, some of which are already in the field, being tested. And last but not least, across medicine and therapeutics, we see the, the many, many, many applications. We heard about vaccinations yesterday. We have antivirals being developed using CRISPR, immunotherapies, gene therapies on the cost of being tested in clinic. The CRISPR world has and is upon us. So scientifically, the impact of CRISPR is very easy to measure. We have some editors and journalists and scientists in, in, the, in the audience. You can see CRISPR makes the cover of one of those uh, journals almost every week, all the time. This is, again, a not exhaustive list, right? So CRISPR is very disruptive, very impactful, very uh, ubiquitous. I must point that one out just for the sake of the actual location that we have today, right? And you can see how women have actually impacted the literature of CRISPR. This is, uh, as of last week, the list of the top 10 most cited CRISPR papers in the world, right? So genome editing, and this is Jennifer and Emmanuel's paper right here. Second most cited. If you think about uh, a diversity, right? This is Feng Zhang and Lei Kong. This is Prashant Mali. Anne Ran, woman first author. Patrick Su, Feng Zhang. Patrick Su yet again here. And again, Jennifer and Emmanuel. So we have diversity extremely well represented across the top 10. I think we have a minority author on all but one of those papers. And we have women, leading authors, young women, the postdocs we heard about, the students we heard about, and the senior authors like Emmanuel and Jennifer and others. So we live in the CRISPR world. If you look at some of the numbers, right, to look at the trend. So we heard about patents this morning. I could do a, a graph on how many CRISPR patents have been applied for at the USPTO since 2012, and it's just unbelievable. And it's just the beginning. It's been very well covered by you know, many colorful narratives, some written by journalists, some written by actual lawyers. There's a lot of CRISPR jokes we can make, like every time a patent is applied for, you know, some, some lawyer puts food on the table. And every time the USPTO bestows a patent and grants a patent, maybe a partner is made, right? Um, but if you look outside of the patents, right, the plasma distribution by ad genes have reached a magical number of 100,000 labs receiving it. One. 100,000 labs 
in over 100 countries. The whole world is colored CRISPR to some extent. 10,000 plasmids deposited, 500 depositing labs, and we reached earlier this summer the 10,000th CRISPR publication. It's crazy. This is illustrating the CRISPR craze thanks to women scientists as aforementioned. Outside of the academic world, CRISPR has been featured in the news. Both Jennifer and Emmanuel were on last year's list of Time 100 most influential people in the world. Hashtag women in STEM, maybe, would be relevant, right? They're featured in NPR and New York Times and Twitter all the time and TV and movies, right? And uh, CRISPR made the cover of both Time Magazine last year on July 4th issue, the most sold issue of the year, by the way. That's not an accident. And then as a longtime reader of The Economist, this is the second time in the last decade that science makes the cover of The Economist. So CRISPR is everywhere. But I would argue that outside of the science and outside of the media, the best way to measure the true impact of CRISPR is the business world. And in the business world, women are playing a very important part outside of science into translating CRISPR into a tangible, impactful series of applications and products. And this slide is from four years ago. Already, we could tell Fortune 10 companies getting into the CRISPR game. Large companies, small companies, even not-for-profit companies got into the CRISPR game very early on. And now we know most of the very large pharmaceutical companies have made a CRISPR bet. So CRISPR has tangibly impacted the whole world. And outside of the CRISPR scientific world, I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes about the business world of CRISPR. All those companies right here are CRISPR startup companies. Just CRISPR startup companies that have come out in the last four years. At the very top is what I'm going to call the first generation of CRISPR companies, the very first CRISPR company ever, Caribou Biosciences. Came out of UC Berkeley, out of Jennifer's lab, and the CEO is a woman. I'll go back to that in a minute. Intelia Therapeutics, CRISPR Therapeutics, ERS Genomics, and Editas Medicine. And of those five companies that were the oldest CRISPR companies, and came out a couple years ago, three already went through an IPO process. Publicly traded company, including one for whom the CEO is a woman. And since then, since the first generation of CRISPR companies, we've had over a dozen CRISPR-focused new startup companies. On the right is Therapeutics, Beam Therapeutics, Mammoth Biosciences, Casibia Therapeutics, and eGenesis. At the bottom right, we have infectious disease companies, Locus, Nixbiotic, Illigo, and Sniper. On the left, we have platform companies, Cazyme, Arbor, LifeEdit. And on the left, we have ag companies, Hairwise Plants, and Inari Ag. All new, novel, rising, VC-backed, influential people on their board, promising companies that feature women. And this is a non-exhaustive list of some of the most influential women in the CRISPR world. So I just picked the top 10. The top 10 companies that, in my mind, are the farthest along. So Caribou, again, great example. Right, the first ever CRISPR company out of UC Berkeley IP, right, the first applied for patent for CRISPR-based genome editing applications in the US, first to file at the time, out of Jennifer's IP, UC Berkeley. And the CEO of this company was the fresh out of school, Rachel Horwitz, Harvard-educated, Berkeley-educated, first-time CEO fresh out of school. The first ever CEO of the first ever CRISPR company was a woman fresh out of school. And that company has done really well as the former chairman of the board. Full disclaimer, I can tell you she's done a fantastic job. This is just an illustration of what the other women do, right? So CEO, their CLO is a woman, they have a BOD member, and founder is a woman. Intelli Therapeutics, three senior VPs, women on the board, and two founding women. CRISPR Therapeutics, BOD, founder, ERS Genomics. ERS stands for Emmanuel, Rodger, and Sean. 
very creative, but it works, right? So Emmanuel, obviously, there. Again, uh, Catherine Bosley, right, woman CEO of the first CRISPR company to ever get an IPO. Very impressive, and they have two women on the BOD. This is an investor out of Arch Ventures, uh, uh, who is backing up Beam Therapeutics on the board, and two women as VPs. For Mammoth, this is Alice Chen, someone else coming out of Jennifer's lab. Uh, she's the CTO and the CRO, uh, both women uh, at Mammoth, and three women founders, including two that were graduate students, co-inventors on the patents that established the tech, yet to be granted, but leading inventors. We talked about inventors today. There's, there's no paucity whatsoever of women inventors in the CRISPR field. I can tell you that. Kasibia, women SVPs, four of them, including minorities, obviously. E-Genesis, out of George Church's lab. So we heard about an uh, old white man. There's many ways to describe George. This is only one of the many adjectives that it could be described by, right? Very unique, colorful, endearing uh, George Church. Um, and Luan. CEO of his first CRISPR startup endeavor. Actually, second, because the first one was uh, Editas. Uh, anyway, so CEO, NCSO, and women on the board of directors. And I like uh, Inari, myself in particular, Ponzi, CEO of Inari App. And they have an ex French woman CSO, also diversity, um, and then two senior VPs including legal and comp. So and that's just you know, my cursory look at the 10 companies I know the best for the CRISPR world. So as far as CRISPR is concerned, we have women covering the science in academia and beyond, covering the business, business and applications, managing positions, board of directors, founders, and we have women investors and inventors covering the IP. We also have a lot of women addressing the biggest challenge of CRISPR, right? So again, Jennifer will be co-hosting uh, next month, uh, the second uh, international meeting on CRISPR ethics. She did co-host the first one at the National Academy of Sciences uh, almost two years ago now. Um, and women are very involved in discussing this and involved in the PR and involved in regulating CRISPR. So the biggest problems of CRISPR thus far are still being led managed, influenced, and actually addressed and solved by the many women that we have in the community. Of course, I would be remiss as the uh, uh, editor-in-chief of the CRISPR journal um, uh, to not mention that this fully CRISPR-dedicated journal is one of the 90 journals right, published by the great Marianne Lieber. Not an accident, right? You have to have vision. You have to be bold to do this. I met her before I signed, the day actually I signed last year, I had to meet her in person before I put a pen to paper. Um, and this journal I mean, has been fantastic, very colorful. A lot more work than I thought it was gonna be at the time, but that's not what today is about, right? Celebrating the field. Uh, the artist uh, that did all those great covers is a woman. Is actually a woman trainee doing her PhD in Denmark. Has that for diversity. Right? Um, and many of the people on the CRISPR team are women. Of course, we have to reflect the most value that we have in our own community. So we have a Chinese woman involved with CAS, on one of the four associate directors. The managing editor is a, actually a graduate student in my lab. Right? We have the great Emmanuel Charpentier and the great Jennifer and many other women. I think we have, I don't know, 13 or 14 or 15 women. I, there's so many, I don't even have to count. It's more than a dozen. And they come from all over the world and cover all realms of diversity. Genetically, ethnically, culturally, socially, and in terms of the kinds of institutions you're affiliated with. Some academic, some not, some for profit, some not. Illustrating the power of women in the CRISPR field. We've also had Jennifer Push, a great project called the CRISPR Movie, which was submitted a couple of weeks ago to Sundance. 
So we can cross the boundaries just of science to explain how science actually works and what better story to tell than the story of CRISPR with women not just at the center, maybe at the happy center, at the heart of the product itself. And we see women play roles across all the key dimensions that are critical for CRISPR success. Again, science, the researchers, some of the big tech transfer offices licensing CRISPR technologies are managed by women. To go back to the uh, IEP discussion we had this morning, right? the tech transfer offices have a very important responsibility in that process. They have to encourage inventorship of women. They have to encourage correct inventorship, as I said this morning. It doesn't have to be fair. It doesn't have, you don't have a quota for diversity. You just have to find the right inventors. It just so happened that most of the key patents for CRISPR have been co-invented by women. That's just a fact. As Neil deGrasse Tyson said, it's just a fact. You don't have to believe in it or not. It's just factual. And we have many of the next generation of CRISPR scientists being women. The list of invited speakers for last year's meeting, this year's meeting, and next year's meeting has been designed to feature as many women as possible. As of right now, I think there's no uh, older white male on the list of guest invited speakers. That's not by accident. We had a, 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 a training session, a workshop, on encouraging diversity in the community, encompassing gender, genotypes and phenotypes and ethnicities, and sexual orientation. We had LGBTQ conversation at the annual CRISPR conference. This stuff is so last year in so many ways. Or maybe this is just a field that's so far ahead. Maybe we can discuss that. In government. Right? The patent office is a very important player in the CRISPR world, whether it's predictable or not, and whether it's globally held the same way or not. You can talk about European patent office versus US patent office and other patent offices and IP in China and all those things, but that's its own conversation probably. Again, in the industry, we have many women entrepreneurs. I mentioned them, CEOs, founders, investors. Arch Venture is a good example. You know, customers and strategic partners and collaborators that are women-driven, and I would say women-fueled. And in society, women have very important roles to play as public and consumers and stakeholders influencing the media. I think, I mean, in hindsight, I should have done a list of like the 10 biggest profiles on Twitter for CRISPR and how many of those are women. That'd be a great, great uh, data point to discuss next year at the next meeting of the Rosalind Franklin Society. So I think in closing, this is, this is an example, an illustration, not to be a contrarian, but to show how much hope or maybe how much progress has already been made in some areas of science where women have been recognized. This is just the beginning, and we should quantify that. How impactful is this truly in terms of relative measurement of success? We heard about women not being nominated enough for awards. Well, exhibit A. Women not being recognized enough. Well, exhibit A. Women not getting the credit for the scientific work. Well, exhibit A. And we hope to see some of these women in some of those card decks right here. But outside of science, we can see already how women are currently influencing and shaping the future of CRISPR as a field, not just in academia, but beyond. So for the sake of time, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to thank the Rosalind Franklin Society for inviting me. And I'm going to make a couple of comments here. So this is my uh, uh, lab as of earlier this year. We have actually added two women since. You can see it's mostly women. We have diversity, we have Hispanics, and we have Asians. Um, and then the last seven graduates that I had in the lab all went to industry. And most of them went to work for CRISPR companies. And most of them are co-inventors on my patents, and most of them are lead authors on the papers that we publish. We just published our 100th CRISPR paper earlier this year from the lab. Um, NC State, when I was a student back then, had a chancellor that was a woman. Uh, when I worked at DuPont for 10 years, the CEO was a woman. Um, Corteva, I think is going to be featured later in the program today, is featuring a woman. My uh, colleagues, Jill Benfield and Jennifer Duna at Berkeley are women. Um, I'm the former chairman of the board of Caribou and the CEO there and board members, women. 
Intelia as women as VPs and founders, and the CRISPR journal as a woman at the helm in her very own name, Marianne Liebert, and last but not least, Ponzi is the CEO of Inar. So as far as I'm concerned, the world that I live in, women are, I can't quite say it, all in charge, because men get some credit to some extent. But I see very good sign of where the world is today in 2018. And women playing their role, getting the recognition that they deserve. Maybe there's some regression to the mean the other way, which is great. But whether it's in science, or academia, or in industry, or in the business world, certainly women are doing a great job. Thank you.